So um, my name is Greta Schrader and I'm the director of the Thompson Free Library in Dover Foxcroft. I know most of you. Um, Kevin, is, Kevin Johnson is joining us from, I think you're in Belfast, you said, Kevin? Yeah, and he is the photo archivist at the Penobscot Marine Museum in Searsport, Maine. And um, really excited about the presentation tonight. He's going to talk with us about the Eastern Illustrating and Publishing Company collection. I think I got that right. Um, a little bit of that, the background of that amazing um, uh, photo collection that they have. And then he's, he's selected some images um, of Dover Foxcroft and some of Milo to share with us tonight. And we have Chris Moss and Mary Annis from the Dover Foxcroft Historical Society. And they'll be providing a little bit more of that local knowledge about the scenes that Kevin shares. And then all of you also have knowledge too, so please feel free to also contribute as we go through this again and making it sort of an interactive um, conversation, I think is the way these normally go. And Kevin is kind enough to be trying this out on Zoom, <laughs> which is a little bit different than when he does these in person. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Kevin. Thanks, Greta. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here presenting for you from my uh, home office in Belfast. Um, as Greta mentioned, I am the photo archivist at the Penobscot Marine Museum. And uh, we don't have that many perks at my job, but one of them is getting invited to go around to all these cool places in Maine and talk about usually the Eastern Illustrating and Publishing Company. So I'm gonna have to take a rain check on you guys um, for now, and we'll do this virtually, but I do hope to get out there someday and see it. Um, I started at the uh, museum back in 2003, um, but just a little bit about the museum. Um, if I was there in person, I would ask people to raise their hands if they've ever been to the Penobscot Marine Museum. And pretty much every place I've gone, there's been at least one or two people that have raised their hands. Um, we're in Searsport, um, which is the next town up from Belfast on Route 1. And um, it's the oldest maritime museum in the state. It was founded in 1936. Um, and at that time, it was a single building. Um, and since then, it has grown um, to be more than, well, there's a debate whether it's 12 or 13 buildings on our campus. Um, but there's a lot to see. There's a, um, you really could spend more than a day there. Um, unfortunately, this is not the season to do the full tour, though we are open and we are offering uh, two tours a day to um, households or groups that um, can be together um, for a tour and you get to go through three of our buildings. Um, you need to call ahead to do this, but maybe uh, some of you guys would be interested in doing a road trip to the coast. Um, so uh, I got to the museum in 2003, and I'm, you're gonna hear a little bit about my story because um, it kind of folds into uh, the collection part of the Eastern Illustrating and Publishing Company. And I'm gonna tell you about um, the history of that company and a little bit about postcards. Um, and then we'll look at looking at the, at the local views. So with that, I'm going to start my slideshow. Um, and as Greta said, if you have questions about what I'm talking, uh, don't hesitate to ask. I'm, I'm happy to fill you in at, at the moment, especially if it pertains to an image um, that I'm showing or something that I'm talking about at the time. Okay. So even though uh, I am not at the Thompson Free Library, uh, here, here's a little view of it, and we'll see it again uh, a little bit later in the slideshow. Okay, um, I'd like to start off all my talks about Eastern Illustrating with this uh, classic Eastern Illustrating postcard. Um, this photo is of uh, Miss R.L. Jackson's postcard shop up in St. Stephen, New Brunswick. And it really sets the stage for this era that um, we're gonna be talking about tonight. Um, at the turn of the century, postcards were the absolute rage. Um, they were one of the first forms of social media. Um, you could, mail was delivered multiple times a day. You could send a postcard in the morning to your neighbor across town and invite them to dinner. Um, they were so popular, in fact, that between the years of um, 1907 and 1908, 667 million postcards were sent in the United States, an average of seven postcards per US citizen. 
And by 1913, that number was up to 968 million. That's nearly a billion postcards sent by Americans through the mail. What, what makes those numbers remarkable is that about half of the postcards that were purchased were never sent. They were purchased um, and kept in photo albums and collected. And postcards are actually the third most collected uh, item in the world. Um, they are behind stamps and coins. So in this view, you can see uh, this, this, I like to compare postcards to uh, emails or text messages or Instagrams of today. Uh, and this postcard shop would have been like, a, uh, like an internet cafe, if you will. Uh, you could go in and choose from the thousands of views available and sit down at the little table in the back with the inkwell and write them out by the warmth of that beautiful stove and drop them in the mailbox in the front um, on your way out. So Eastern Illustrating, um, they were a postcard company started in Belfast and they um, began in 1909, which is right in the thick of this whole postcard craze. Um, the vast majority of postcards that were made were printed in Europe, um, mostly Germany. And uh, they were the color postcards and lithograph cards that you see. Um, but they mostly serviced the bigger cities and all the smaller towns and villages could get generic cards, but rarely could they get um, a good set of images of where they lived. And that was the angle that Eastern Illustrating saw um, to their success in the postcard industry. The man standing in the front is um, Rudolf Hermann Cassens. Um, he was born in Rockland. His parents were German immigrants. Um, and he went to work um, for his father-in-law, who was, um, among other things, uh, the mayor of Belfast, um, published one of Belfast's two local newspapers, um, was a publisher, and was also involved in other businesses like um, Dana Sasparilla. Um, we believe that Herman learned the publishing trade from his father-in-law and then decided to start this postcard company. But his angle on it was to make real photo postcards, which are actually photographic images printed on um, photo paper. Um, but there was, the photo paper was actually postcard stock. Um, behind the car in the center um, is one of um, Cassin's photographers from Winterport. And on the far left is um, Cassin's brother, Ned, who took views in Vermont and New York. You'll notice on the side of the car, his sign tells how ambitious he was. He wanted to photograph the entire continental United States, making real photo postcards of all little towns and villages. And though he never pulled that off, he and his photographers did thoroughly cover all of New England and upstate New York. Um, and even a scattering of towns um, on the way down to Florida, and then most of Florida, um, where Cassin would spend the winters. In Belfast, they got their start um, in the Waldo Herald office. Um, the Waldo Herald was one of the newspapers that I mentioned before that was owned by his father-in-law. And they started in that building. Um, and you can see that some of the crew and the photographers uh, posing out front. And here we see the crew in 1916 um, on Bridge Street in Belfast. This is the crew that worked in the postcard factory. Uh, I like to joke and say that the factory was manned by women and it really, they were the, the primary workforce there. Um, it was mostly a summer business or a seasonal business and there are very few winter views in the collection. Um, but they would take care of processing the glass plates, making prints, filling orders, all the things that went into it. And if you've been to Belfast, uh, you might be familiar with this view. We're looking down High Street coming into town. Um, on the left would be our movie theater with the elephant on top. And that building behind the uh, two maple trees on the left was the Shoot and Shory garage. Um, and the white building across the street that kind of looks like a house, um, that was the Eastern Illustrating Factory once they moved out of the Waldo Herald building. So when they were at their peak, they were producing more than a million postcards a year out of that building. The stories go that they uh, didn't have enough room to dry out their wet postcards when they came out of the uh, chemical baths and they would wheel them on racks across the street to use one of the car, um, 
garage bays at the Shoot and Shoy garage. That building is no longer there and it's a now a public green in the town. And the church, the North Church that you see behind it has since lost its steeple and is now the American Legion Hall. Now this is not the inside of the Eastern Illustrating Factory, but this is probably very similar to what it would have looked like in the room where they did their processing. Um, I mentioned that they made real photo postcards and real photo postcards mean they use the traditional wet darkroom method um, to process them. And that is a three step bath of a, a developer bath, a stop bath, and then a fixer bath. And then and th during this time period, they would be washed and then they would be sepia toned. Um, they would be done in sort of mass, they were kind of mass produced. You can see uh, how all the cards are floating in these different chemicals and they would be stirred with big wooden paddles. You'll notice um, a sign up in the upper right that says, don't spit. Um, apparently tobacco juice is probably not the best thing for the photochemistry. Um, I fear that most of the used fixer, um, which contained all the extra silver from the process was dumped into the bay um, along with other industries that were working in Belfast at that time. The photographers, uh, unlike the women that worked in the, worked in the uh, factory, the photographers were all men. Um, and they all had vehicles, usually Model Ts like this one with a, um, a jury rigged back to hold um, all their photography equipment and whatever luggage they brought with them. And then the sign that advertised who they were. Um, they each, they, they must have had uh, probably up to 10 photographers on staff each season. And when the roads were hard enough to drive, to drive on in the spring, they would, um, they would leave Belfast each to their designated regions of New England. Um, they wouldn't come back typically for the whole season. And most of what they did was um, dealt with by train. So they would go into a town. Um, they would spend a day there, um, set up in a boarding house or a hotel, a campground, and they would um, make the acquaintance usually of a store owner um, and find out what the local important views were of that area. And they would spend a day or two um, working on it, um, taking photographs, and then they would send their exposed plates back to Belfast right. where they were... Uh, processed and sample cards sent back to them, they'd take an order and head off to the next town. Is there a question uh, that was coming up? No? Uh, no, I think that was just someone entering the meeting. Okay. So as time went on, this company started in 1909, as the years passed, they would revisit different towns and whenever um, new views were warranted, they would make them. And, um, after a couple decades passed, there was enough different views of a region that each salesman would have his own catalog of all the views available. So he would show up in a general store and show the owner and they would flip through and tell them how many they wanted of each, of each card. Um, so it was kind of, an, I imagine it to be a kind of a romantic kind of lifestyle driving around beautiful New England in the summertime to many of these places that were tourist destinations um, and otherwise, and um, take photographs. Um, I don't think it was very lucrative. They apparently made commission, straight commission, with a little bit of money for travel expenses. And during the early part of this, postcards sold two for five cents. So uh, you can imagine how many postcards had to be sold um, for, to make a living as a postcard um, seller. <laughs> I've also talked about glass plate negatives and Eastern Illustrating glass plate negatives were, they were the film of this era. They're not the same type of glass plates that were used during the Civil War. This is a more modern version um, that would have started in the late 1890s, um, which was called the dry plate. But these were pre-coated glass plates that would come in a box. Um, they came in a bunch of different sizes. Eastern Illustrating used five by seven glass plates, so you could get them pretty much um, in any size. This particular brand that you're looking at, um, the Stanley, um, was a type that was invented by the Stanley Brothers. Um, you're probably familiar with them um, as 
as inventors of the steam car. But what many people don't know is one of their earliest inventions was to improve the glass plate negative and make it faster, meaning that the exposure time to make a photograph was shorter, um, which definitely opened up a lot of doors for photography. They sold this technology to Eastman Kodak um, and used that money that they made to pump back into their um, inventing business when they came up with the Stanley Steamer. I also like to point out that on the bottom of the box it says open in ruby light. Ruby light would be the safe light or the red light that you see in dark rooms. Um, this film was a fairly slow film in the sense that it could be exposed to um, red light and not, be, uh, not affect the exposure and that's what the photographers did was they would load their film holders with this before they went out shooting. Um, if you are a postcard collector um, and you have a bunch of postcards of Dover Foxcroft, you might want to look on the back and I'm sure you'll find that you'll have some Eastern Illustrating. They had these ornate um, seal that they would put on the back of their early cards and the seal um, evolved over time um, and there are various versions of it. Um, often um, really uh, making sure that people knew the fact that these were genuine photographs. They were the real thing, not a mass produced card. Here's another one of their backs. So um, Herman Cassens ran and operated the um, Eastern Illustrating um, all the way up until the mid 1940s. Um, still making black and white postcards, but the postcard rage had definitely ebbed a little bit and the type of postcards being made um, was also changing. But he still was able to sell the business to a man named Alton Crone in 1947. And Crone continued to make real photo postcards until the early 1950s. Um, ultimately, um, a couple of different owners came about and they went color and made color postcards. And in the early 1980s, um, still going, the Eastern, Eastern Illustrating was purchased by the owners of Down East Magazine. Um, this building here, um, if you're ever driving through Rockport on Route 1, you'll see is the Down East Magazine building. At this time, it was a guest house for um, a wealthy family that lived in that area, but now it's Down East. Down East um, purchased the business and the collection with the ideas of having a vintage postcard line and also wanted to have access to the old photos for stock for their magazine. But the sheer size of the collection um, and the disorganization of it at that point really prevented that either of those things from happening. And what ultimately happened was that they sold the business name um, to a, an outfit in Union that still makes postcards and calendars today. And they donated the whole archive of negatives um, to the main photographic workshops in Rockport. Here we're looking at a photo of Rockport Harbor. And if you look on the right, you'll see a series of brick buildings and the one closest to the water um, up high is Union Hall. It was the part of the main photographic workshops. Um, and it's there that I first encountered um, this collection. I went to um, Rockport for photography school and did the year long program and was a teaching assistant the following year for the same program. And when that was finished, I wanted a reason to be able to stay in this creative bubble of the workshops. Um, and I got the opportunity by dealing with this collection that they earned. When I was a student, anytime I went into the library, the librarian would have stacks of these glass plates on her desk um, and that she was counting and sorting and making a rough index. And one day I went in there and there were probably six or seven boxes of, post of glass negatives of Greensboro, Vermont. Um, Greensboro, Vermont is a little, uh, little tiny village up in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont where I used to go um, every summer for a couple of weeks with my family. Um, a quaint little place that has a general store and a lake and that's about it. And I couldn't imagine what all these photos were um, that would have been taken back then. And I started looking at them and was really enamored with the imagery. And because I was at the photographic workshops, I could take the negatives into the dark room and make prints. Um, and so I got a chance to take over caring for this collection. Um, the school had hopes that the collection would be a moneymaker for them, selling um, prints and licensing the images. 
And, but it took a, a while to figure out the whole digitization process and starting a database. And unfortunately, um, while this was all going on, the uh, economy was crashing and the school ran into financial trouble. And <clears throat> here's a picture of myself and uh, my digital guru, Matt Thorne, back in the early days um, in the basement of Union Hall. Um, this is where I learned how to digitize. I had gone to school there, but I was learning the old processes, not the new ones. So uh, I had a lot to learn. Um, but when the economy bottomed out and the banks foreclosed on the school, we all lost our jobs. And it was in February of um, 2007 that I received the dreaded phone call. Um, the owner of the school had turned off the heat in the buildings um, because he didn't have the money to pay for it. And the pipes burst. And I got a call from this guy, Matt, telling me that the collection was soaked and was about to be thrown out. Um, and it was Super Bowl Sunday, and I was having some friends over to watch the game, and I bribed them with some beer, I believe, and dragged them all down to Rockport. And we spent six hours that night um, in the basement of Union Hall. This was my, that same work area you just saw me in the previous picture. This is it. Um, there's about three inches of water on the floor. Uh, and it was so cold that it was freezing um, immediately. You would pick up one of these uh, archival boxes that I had been putting the negatives in and you would have to wait for a minute or two for all the water to drain out of it. It was really a, a pretty grim scene. Um, but we got all the negatives out and brought them to the dining hall, which was the only building on the campus that still was heated. And I made some frantic phone calls to the Eastman House and RIT to find out if there was anything I could do to save all these negatives. And the good news I received was that it was okay that they got wet. Um, it was part of their natural process and they could be dried and they would be fine um, with an asterisk on the end. Um, they couldn't dry in these uh, paper envelopes that I had been putting them in for two years at this point. Um, and they couldn't dry touching another envelope or another negative or the emulsion side of one would stick to the back of another and then off and separated them. So I came up with a plan and bought Home Depot out of all their wire bathroom racks and took over a few of the digital classrooms and for the next six weeks um, went down and dried out the collection, wrapping everything in plastic to keep it wet until I could deal with it. This is one of my photography professors, Brenton Hamilton, who would check in, check in on me every once in a while. Um, during this whole time, um, the school ended up being sold to a nonprofit group that is running it today called the Main Media Workshops. But they didn't see um, this collection as being part of their vision for the school. Um, and since it had been donated to the school, it had to be donated somewhere else. Um, and so the owner of the school, David Lyman, donated the collection to the Penobscot Marine Museum in Searsport, but they had a catch. The catch was that they had to take me with the collection and give me a job. So it all, I don't know if it was fate or what, but it all kind of worked out in the end. Um, here we're looking at an early view of the Penobscot Marine Museum um, when it was pretty much brand new, um, right around 1936 or 37. And at that time, it was this single building, which had been the Searsport Town Hall and Jail. Um, and now this is the home of our fisheries exhibit. It's a permanent exhibit related to the Penobscot Bay fisheries. And to the left of it is a big modern library that was built in the 1990s that houses our collections, um, including all the photography archives. So this is uh, what the collection looks like today. You can see what you're looking at there are the first 10,000 of the main negatives. So about not even a quarter of the collection um, as it stands. And each one of those boxes weighs about 25 pounds. Uh, the glass is heavy. We actually had to have our um, building, um, the building architect come in and sign off where our shelving would go so that we wouldn't overload a floor with all this weight. And uh, since its arrival, um, it came on the heels of another big collection that arrived at the museum, the Red Boudelier collection. And instantly it, it um, made photography a, a, major, um, a major feature of, of the museum. What you're looking at here is my group of volunteers that has um, emerged since I started 
at the museum back in 2007. And I have more than 20 of them. Um, they come in and they scan and they catalog, they research for exhibits, um, and are really the workhorses of everything that um, we've been able to accomplish there um, at the museum. I'm very fortunate. Unfortunately, during uh, this whole pandemic, they have not been able to come in, um, which is sad for both of us. Um, but we do hope uh, in the not too distant future, we'll be able to get them back in. Um, the photography archives have more than 300,000 photographic images now. Um, so Eastern is one of the biggest of the collections, but not the biggest. And we have more than 100,000 images available online. Um, all the images that I'll show you shortly of um, Dover Foxcroft are available online and you can check them out and you can order prints or tell me about them to make the um, descriptions better. When you go to our website and search and find the uh, menu choice for search our collections database, it'll bring you to this page um, where you can read the search tips, which I suggest, and then you'll get a search field similar to this. It's changed a little bit since uh, I made this particular part of the slideshow, but this uh, will show you the different fields that you can search um, in, and you get results that will pull up something like so, where you have the image and what we know about it and the collection. Um, there's a button that says send feedback, which is how um, people that are looking at something um, online and can tell us something about the image can send us that information. Um, and there's also a button to order a print. The collection um, has been featured in this book, which I got to um, author with my two history heroes, Earl Shuttleworth, who is, as you probably know, the main state historian, and um, William H. Bunting, or Bill Bunting as I know him, um, who wrote all the captions for this. And uh, it's a book that I'm really proud of and even won um, a couple of awards um, for it. And there was also a documentary made about the collection called The Northeast by Eastern, which was made um, in 2016 by Summer McCain of this tacit. Um, and you may have even seen it on MPBN um, over the past couple winters when they have been showing it. The collection also gets used uh, a lot with both students and um, personal projects for projects like this, uh, Then and Now, where uh, what I've done is I've gone around with different school groups and found the site of the original picture and then take its modern day version. Um, and it's a really powerful teaching tool of showing how um, things have changed, or in some cases they haven't. This is one of, example of how things have definitely changed. <laughs> if only Sears Island is the, uh, the focal point to, to base our we photograph on. And Lastly, this is the last thing I'll talk about before showing the Dover Foxcroft images, is that when I was working with the collection at the workshop, there were more than 35,000 negatives, um, but I soon learned that we did not have the whole collection. Um, thousands of negatives escaped over the years prior to the collection arriving at the museum. Um, and I've been spending, uh, it's, I'm kind of obsessed with trying to put the collection back together. So since um, I came to the museum in 2007, I've been able to find and reacquire more than 15,000 of the negatives. Mm. One group of them, um, almost 7,000 negatives, was in the hands of a postcard dealer. And we worked out a way of purchasing, from, um, purchasing the, the negatives from him over a period of time. And uh, the way that we've been raising the money is that people can adopt the town and donate the money to secure a certain town's negatives. Um, there are no Dover Foxcroft negatives to be adopted, but I did just glance around at the uh, map to see some of the local towns that are still available to be adopted. And obviously get in touch with me if you have any questions about that. So now we're going to get into the Dover Foxcroft images. And this is where you know, I'm forced to admit that I'm from New Jersey, I'm a flatlander, but I did escape um, and I'm glad to call me in my home now. Um, but when I go around and talk, um, and, and show images of a certain town, I, I really rely on the local historians um, to tell me about what I'm seeing and also to help educate the rest of the audience. Um, so I'll have some tidbits to say about the different views that we're looking at, but mostly relating to the postcard company and the processes. And uh, 
working with Chris and Mary here, um, who possibly can um, share with the audience information about what we're looking at. Uh, Chris, you want to? Yeah, chime right? Kevin. Uh, two things I think to bring up. Alex, you just did a senior thesis on postcards, correct? Yes, Chris, I did, uh, including some of the Eastern illustrating. Yes. Okay. So, uh, and wow. uh, and uh, people awesome. with more local knowledge than Mary and I, I suspect. Uh, Carlson Williams grew up here as well as some other people who I see on the list. And uh, Carlson, your comments and, and other folks who've been in here would be very welcome. For instance, this one right here, Kevin, you can tell us about the photograph, correct? I can tell you it's a five by seven glass plate negative. Do you, um, know, who, do you know who the Stevens person is? I don't. It's, uh, I think it's Lillian Stevens. She was president, national president of the WCPU for several years. Wow. And this was on South Street, was it, South Carlson? Street. There's a little plaque out there on South Street right. um, commemorating where the house was. The house is gone, though, now. Yes. Okay. okay, the house is no longer there. Yeah. But that's that's kind of a famous person, at least for this part of the, of the woods. And it would be great, great info to have for our database. That's the kind of feedback that I hope to find. The house is still there. The house is not still there, is what right. I just heard. It's gone. Okay, it's Foxcroft School. So here we're looking at the Foxcroft School, and um, I'll offer this. Uh, um, I do know that Dover Foxcroft joined forces in 1922. And we have negatives um, in this group that I'll show you that some are just of Dover, some are just of Foxcroft, and then there are some of Dover Foxcroft. Um, they'll tell us, at least get us into a date range um, that they were taken. So this was obviously before 1922 that this image was taken. And we see others uh, that say Dover Foxcroft that it will have been 1922 or later. That building was built, I think, around 1875, Carlson. Anybody knows? It, it was torn down in the 50s. Some of you may remember it. And uh, it was the, the lot that it was on is empty. It's, it's behind what we know of as the Nor'easter restaurant near the post office. And people who remember it, Lou Stevens remembered it as, as a, as a as a building that was constantly being built on. So it was a rabbit warren of rooms. Was it all grades? Or did they have a separate high school? Uh, K-8, the, the high school kids always went to the academy. Oh, okay. You'll probably have a picture or two of the academy. Oh yeah. Main Street. Does it look the same today? Well, it, it does in a way because we still have the Masonic building, which is that large one with the that sticks up there with the two chimneys. And the building next door, that's still is there. Um, Actually on both sides. To, yeah, yeah, on both sides, yeah. And this this one, it's uh, the Union Square Mall now, right? Is it Karitsky? Right, that's correct. That's the Karitsky building that was built in 1895. And uh, uh, Jack moved in with a shoe store originally about 1910. This picture is probably 1920-ish, Kevin? And, well, it's at least 1922 because of the Dover Foxcroft. There you go. There you go. Cars definitely look like mid-20 cars. Right. The big building, the Masonic Temple, uh, was built in 1875. And next to it, the little brick building, was the Hopkins block, built in the 1830s. The other side is, is now a, a, a chiropractor's office. The white building, the three-story building, is now gone. It's a parking lot. 
the three-story building with the flat roof is still there, although it's only two floors now. They had a fire there in the 20s. And across the river, we don't see the river, but across the river, uh, basically all that's gone. The big brick building burned and the Exchange Hotel is now gone. So this side of the river is still kind of there, the rest isn't. Is that brick building in the middle is that the one that the moose went through? Yes. Mm -hmm. It yes. has a nice little porch up above. On That's the right. Floor. That's Did you right. say the moose went through? Yes, that was a recent event, Kevin. Oh. <laughs> it's piqued my interest for sure. <laughs> right. It's it, sort of abandoned now. It, it sounded sick looking. It's too bad. Yeah, the Historical Society is probably going to buy it oh, and, bring, and bring it back. Oh, yeah, Mary. That would be wonderful. <laughs> yep. This is Monument Square looking up North Street uh, off to the left. And to the right is uh, Lincoln Street going out. And this was, this was Willis Ham's, the building on, this, on the corner, was Willis Ham's grocery store. The old timers tell me that the brothers who ended up with the with what we know of as Wills today started there in that building. It was at various times a shoe store, etc. The building to the right is gone now, but the buildings down the street are still pretty much there. Okay, although the one in the corner is gone. And if you look down into the next block, there's a there's a house there with the trees behind it. That's yeah. gone. That's now the post office built in the late 30s. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about the titling that you see on the on the images. Mm -hmm. That titling is actually on the negative, um, and it was written by the young women that worked at the postcard factory in black washable ink, and they um, had to write backwards on the back of the negative so that in the printing process, the black would be turned to white mm. and then the, the writing would be mirrored and appear properly on the card. The number letter combination, this one says 18T, was uh, used by the photographers and when they would load up their film holders for a day of shooting, they would write in pencil on the edge of every plate a number series. And you can see that 18T backwards on the right side of um, the image. Mm -hmm. So when they were out photographing for the, for the day, they would have a sheet of paper that had this number series and they would make a photograph and then next to that number, write what it was that they photographed. And then they would send that list along with the exposed glass plates back to Belfast where the girls would process the film see the number on the side and be able to match it to the title that they should write on the card. And over the years, when they would revisit the town and make new negatives, they would use a different number series, which is how they distinguished um, from each other. But what, what you'll find, the previous photo that I showed had a 14T, this is 18T. Um, the 14T was taken probably 10 minutes before this one. Um, and they were probably walking right down the center of town and every so often stopping and making a photograph. Here's 13T in its next view. Um, what's valuable about that is if you can date one postcard in a series, then you've dated that particular series because they all would have been taken um, within one or two days of each other. That's cool. That's wonderful. Here we see a cool uh, um, scene where horse and buggies are sharing the parking spaces with uh, some fancy cars of the early 20s or the mid 20s. Yeah. Another view of Main Street, which I don't see the Masonic building. So is this the opposite side of the street? Uh, the city. The chimney for the uh, mill and the steeple for the church. Oh, yeah. Yep. Are there, and the New Star Theater, the big building on the, on the far right, the white building. Oh, yeah that burned in 1940 and like five months later we had the the what we now know of today as the center theater that was there the one with the gas station in the front the two-story building um, yeah. that's still there 
And that was originally a photography shop. And it had one flo one story. And of course, it had the glass went the roof, right? So you could take the pictures. Sure, yeah. And yeah. that was Dinsmore's photography shop. The building on the corner, the brick building is still there, of course. And the one, I think, guys, help me out here. Of the three buildings to the left of it, one of them is still there or not? Or are they all gone? We look out. We look out of the historical society at that all the time, and <laughs> <laughs> right. Of course, the mail block is still there. Um, I'm trying to think what's next to it. Yeah, I think the one next to the brick building is still there. Yeah. At this point, well, the the two that are beside the brick building, like coming closest to us, I would say, mm -hmm. are still there. One of them has just been renovated. So remember that it's the, um, what used to have like the little train, yeah, right. little train in train. there. So they just renovated that. You're right. But okay. they, they own all three of those buildings still. Okay. But and the they, one, the white one is gone. That's it, like a alleyway now. It, it burned in a fire in the early sixties and Lou Stevens uh, took photographs of it burning. Yeah. If you're ever interested. The smokestack came in 1918 for the mill. It was a square one before that, and they replaced it. The big building on the end, on the, the furthest one away, the big brick one, isn't that isn't that P.E. Ward's building? Yes, it is. True value. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now the true value, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that That's very familiar. Monument <laughs> where, where it is? Hmm? Does the monument still stand at this uh, little square? Yes, it does. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. And you're looking out at the congregational church, which is still very much there. Yeah. and uh, kind of the centerpiece. Behind the, the monument is the old Foxcroft High School. Oh, the okay. On the far left, okay? We have lots of pictures of that. And behind the cannon on the right uh, is the chapel for the uh, Congregational mm -hmm. Church, which of course is still there today. The stuff on the right, the garage sign and everything before that, that's all gone now. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, but that's gone. That's beautiful. We do not have that. This uh, this one. How does the uh, a lot of these from postcards that you have? Yeah. Some of these we have. Most we don't. Did somebody have a question about the one before? Well, I was going to mention the uh, the cannons are not plugged in it. Ooh. They're both, they're plugged with a granite plug now because uh, someone I think in the 30s lit it off and broke all the windows in town. <laughs> that was Fernald Richards, but I'm not naming names. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now we're looking at North Street again. Um, you can see the man in the, in the, the barbershop, but it kind of looks like the barbershop. Well, actually, that was Nickerson's at the time. That was Nickerson's drugstore. He was yeah, a pharmacist. Okay. Oh yeah, it's the medicine. It's like, yep. it's medicine. It's and uh, um, what's his face? The doctor who came back from the Civil War, Buck. Buck, uh, yeah. Uh, had his drugstore there, and he he gave it to. He was partners with Nickerson, and Nickerson finally got it. And uh, uh, Mary, you know what was in the basement there, right? Yeah, underneath there were uh, several stores. I think it was a barber shop, and there was um, a Bush's lunch, which later was Annis's lunch. Um, uh, uh, Bush was the first, uh, yeah, oh, what, what was this? Harry Bush. Mm -hmm. He was a confectioner in town, had, had several places, and he had a, like a restaurant under there. And uh, later, uh, his uh, stepson bought it and turned it into Amethyst. In recent years, there was um, Oh, 
Miles Smith's daughter had the cock of the walk, a little gift shop mm -hmm. down underneath. Okay. And you guys, of course, remember, was it Parents Drugstore that was in there for years? And uh, ultimately, it was a Western Auto. We have pictures of it being, the building being torn down with the Western Auto. The building behind it had two things. It had the Foxcroft Bakery, and we had some artifacts mm -hmm. in the Historical Society. And it also had the Piscataqua Steam Laundry that was there for many years. That mm -hmm. building and the one next to it are both gone now. In fact, all three of them are gone. And that's where the wheels is, the shop and trade. Mm -hmm. In its parking lot. The little bit of a corner on the left-hand side was the L on the uh, Foxcroft Exchange. And when they tore down the, the main part, that was still there for many years. It was the Piscataquas, Piscataquas Club, a men's club, I think. It, of course, is gone now as well. And just so you want to know, Chris, we have the spittoon from that club. We have what? The spittoon from that club in our collection. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. <laughs> um, I just I'll just add that these um, because these negatives are big, five inches by seven inches, the resolution is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't show you on a PowerPoint, but um, I could zoom way in on this photo, and you could clearly see who this person was standing in front of the drugstore. And we probably could read the date of this um, circus advertisement that's. Um, posted, which would right. tell us the year um, that these photos were taken. All these ones with the T on the end. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful. So I'll get back to you on that. This one's backwards. It's my fault. Yep, sure is. <laughs> Everybody I'll, knows. I'll confuse everyone. I'll just move around. Oh, wait. Could you go back, Kevin? Let's see if I can. I haven't quite figured out how to do that. Oops. Use your left arrow key on the keyboard. Yeah. Of course, everybody knows. Yep, that's the Silas Paul house on the left and Dr. Buck's house, the next to it, he who of the drugstore fame. And we're, oh, okay. looking, and we're looking out West Main Street with all those, what are those elm trees, I guess? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the car now. that you can see down parked on that side of the street is the photographer's car. You can see the box on, on the back of it. Yep. Oh, now we're in East Dover. This is, the negatives aren't in order in this slideshow, so we we'll bounce back and forth a little bit, but um, we are in East Dover now. We're looking at Crockett, Crockett's Brickyard. Um, and this is a different number series. Um, it doesn't have the T on the end. Um, and these are obviously dated before um, the 1922 date um, because um, the other fast track was not, had not joined. Pretty well, fascinating is, uh, image. This is East Dover. There was the brickyard. All the bricks that were used in town to make all the brick buildings came from that brickyard. It's about five miles east of... Uh, do of, uh, of Dover Fox, well, it is part of Dover Foxcroft, but about five miles east of the uh, Dover village mm -hmm. on the river. Been amazing. The yeah. original settlers came to East Dover, um, 1799. That's where it started. Wow. We call this a light station, but I'm assuming it generated some uh, electricity. Yes. Yes, again in East Dover. And of course, that's all gone now. If you looked at it, you would see the river and you'd see woods all over the place. Wow. Was this a dam? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to generate the power for the electricity. Okay. And the dam is gone as well? I don't know. With a different dam or? I think it is. I think the East Dover Dam is gone. There's just remnants there and the bridge over over to the Range Road. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
that's recognizable. That's where some of us are now. <laughs> if you could that's point Mayo. Your, you could um, Mayo. Yeah, point your. Uh, Kevin, what does the 16X signify? Different number series than the T. So it doesn't have it doesn't have anything to do with a date per se. It's just the number series that the photographer wrote down the edge of the plates. Um, is there is there any way you could ever trace that back? To a date? Yeah. Yes, to, to some extent. What I mentioned previously in that photo with they had the poster, we could probably date that image. Those images ended with a T. This one ends with a with an X, which, so I think it's not the same, but we'll look for other ones that end with an X um, to help us out. We know it's post-1922. Um, it still looks like it's, you know, maybe, I don't think it could be later than the early 1930s. No, it can't be. You see the uh, brick, the square chimney is up there. It hadn't yet been replaced. The uh, opera house is still there. The big brick building in the background, and the yep. two to it's to to our right on that. Uh, Thomas's Hardware and McNaughton's Grocery Store on the edge, which was the original Foxcroft Academy in the eighteen in eighteen fifty. Those are all gone. They burned in a fire. New Year's Eve thirty five thirty six. Look back to East Dover for a minute. You see the Grange Hall. That's still there. It's uh, it? company president. Wow. And I'm sure this bird's eye view would be hard to recreate today because I suspect that the trees have grown back. Oh. Yeah. What I would have suspected is that uh, the photographer shot a whole box of plates at East Dover, which would be 15 plates, um, probably more in the center of town. Mm. Is the railroad station still there? No. No. Yeah. No, it's gone. Mm. They stopped in the 30s. This was the Dover or the Bangor and Piscataqua became the Bangor and Aroostook and uh, came in 1869 and uh, stopped the passenger service in 1930s sometime. And the, the last freight, I think, went out in the 80s. Any guys been around a while? My husband shipped a steam road roller on the train and took off on the siding here and drove it up Park Street. And that was in 62. Okay. Isn't the, um, aren't there a couple of buildings on Depot Street that are still extant? Yeah, there's a barn falling down. Now, of course, this was, this is the one in East Dover, not the one we're thinking of oh. in, in Dover. Oh, yeah. But, but uh, yeah, yeah that, that barn that's falling down was their freight house. Oh. It's still there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's a square in Dover. That looks really familiar, doesn't it, Tom? <laughs> yes, it does. I lived there in that store. <laughs> you lived in the store? Well, I used to get my papers across the road from here. And uh, Merrick Square Market, I mean, I spent years there. Yeah, yeah. It's a wonderful place. <clears throat> Weber's hasn't changed a bit. Weber's, nope. That was Weber's hardware at the time, yep. uh, when we were kids. <laughs> Nope. The house on the right is still there. Yeah, Anderson. Uh, no, no, it's gone. Oh, has uh, it gone? That that one was dismantled and uh, taken someplace to Connecticut or some damn thing. Beautiful really? house. I have oh, a that, yeah. Yeah. That yeah. Is there. I didn't realize that. If you ask Ellen, she still spits the <clears throat> She's still mad about it, yeah. <laughs> She's still mad. Now, you notice the post office there in the middle? Was that a post office? Yep, that was a post office, huh. a lawyer's office above that. But uh, that dates this picture before 1917 when yeah. the big scandal took place and, and, they, and they took it away. Now, 
Tom and Sue, what, what are the buildings to the left? When, when we were kids, it was McDonald's Ford between uh, Merrick Square building and the library. Right. Uh, there was yeah. a Ford, and that burned down as well. Okay. And we shouldn't have let Tom play with matches. I, <laughs> I know. <it. laughs> the watering trough is still there. Oh, it is. Yep. Oh, yeah. And it's got a little... On the other side, if you looked on the other side, it's got it's got a little opening there. And I read in the newspaper, the editor said that was for the dogs in town. <laughs> was this still operating when you were kids, Tom? Uh, what, excuse me? Was the water fountain still operating when you were? No, in? no, it wasn't. Yeah. It was a more of a watering trough than a fountain. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. This was this was uh, known as dead end. And I couldn't gonna, yeah. ever I was going to ask if somebody we, knew, knew that. We were the dead end kids. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. The originals. <laughs> Three. And Kimball's store was right at the end of that. Yep, those two old bags. Right. <laughs> it would be on the right. Yeah. Athens Brothers Garage and Dover Fox Garage. Yeah. Oh. Where yeah. was that? This is, this was. This would be, well, if you look behind it, the big building behind it is Central yeah. Hall. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Now, you know that alley between the Methodist Church and Central Hall that you drive down? Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. That's, that's now open again. At the end of that alley was the other garage door for the Blessed Brothers garage. Okay. In fact, the deed to the town for Central Hall in 1924 has reference to making sure that the alley stayed open for the entrance to the Bletton Brothers garage. Mm. These were kids, of course, from the original Bletton family. And they had the garage. Of course, it got torn down to build the, uh, the additions to the back of the Methodist church. I love that picture. Well, that's in the lake road. That's now the parsonage for the uh, Pentecostal church. J.Q. Lander across the street near what we would think of as Rowell's today had a kitchenware and tinware store. He was there for 40 years, did a lot of advertising, was one of the important people in town. That's probably him in front of his house. It still looks pretty much like that without the barns. The carriage is yeah, it's all, they're all gone, but the mm -hmm. house is still there. Okay. Yeah, that's still there. It is? Mm-hmm, up on High Street. Why does it say... Oh, Pentecost? the Advent Church. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Why does it what, Kevin? It says Bethel above the doorway. Don't know. I'm curious as to what that... The Advent Church is, is that still a working church? I don't think so. Yeah. I think Bethel had something to do with Bethlehem, but I don't know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. That's a good old courthouse and sheriff's office. <laughs> and Frank's the, Hotel. <laughs> and the Bluffin House uh, on this side of the street. Yeah. Um, this was... The reading the newspaper in, in 1900, because Kevin, we still have all of the uh, observers back yeah. to 1838. Um, the uh, the, sh the uh, sheriff's house, which was what that was, was built in 1900. And the next year, they built the jail behind it. And of course, it's not there. So that dates this picture at 1900. Isn't that the Pleasant Street School? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Some of you guys went to the Pleasant Street School, didn't you? I did. <laughs> cool looking building. You, uh, Sue, you you knew that the belfry on the top there, when this when the thing was built, they made room for a town clock there because Foxcroft had one, so Dover had to have one. 
And every couple years in the Observer, you would see a little update on the money they'd collected for the clock. <laughs> they never got enough money for the clock because everybody used the Foxcroft clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. I remember so I went kindergarten through third grade there. Yeah, okay. I, re I remember when it was torn down, but I yeah, don't. me too. That was sad. Mm -hmm. that, that building was gone. It's gone now. Oh yeah, it's now a park, a little park. Central Hall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Central Hall. Look at the trees. Still there. On the right, you see the Methodist Church that was built in 1860, still there, beautiful uh, uh, balcony on the inside. And on the left, you see, what's his face, his house, the, the congressman, it's on the National Register, Mayor, I forget his name. Doug Smith. Doug Smith. <laughs> yeah, well, a few years later. Uh, Central Hall was really falling down, Kevin, and it was in terrible disrepair. And the historical study started the drive to bring it back. And just two years ago, we reopened it after raising about a million seven to oh, bring, nice. bring it back and put it back to life. It's very that vibrant. Is, yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. This is the town owns the building. Like the community building now for? Yeah. Or is it, yeah. yeah. The, the, before the COVID came and the year before, they had over 400 events in that building the year before that. Wow. And the, the people who run it just do a wonderful job of, uh, of making it work. You should come up when they do the contra dances on the second floor. They'd have a couple hundred people in there having a wonderful time. Wow. Yeah. It's well, congratulations on getting that done. That's a labor of love for sure. Well, that's, that's Mary. Ooh, we don't have this one. That's brand smell. Yeah. Yep. Actually, the Brown Mills. And uh, this, is it ever going to come back, do you think? I hope so. Look what they did with the Mayo Mill. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, with the Mayo Mill. Somebody's yeah. garden right there in the front. That's pretty yeah, awesome. that's yep. Yep. So Peas growing up there. This was, there were two, the, the two woolen mills that were in town. This was always the most important one. They had the highest fall of water. They had the most power. And uh, they could, uh, they could uh, produce more woolens. When American Woolen bought these guys out in 1899, they didn't buy the other one for another 15 years, Mayo's Mill. And they only bought it because they wanted the water rights. And unfortunately, what they did was they mixed up the production of the woolens. And uh, so part was done up there and part was done down here. So that when times got hard in the woolen industry, they had to shut them both down. And this was in 1953. And that was the end of the woolen mills. Buildings are still there, kind of decrepit right now. And it became a tannery. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, it was you a tannery when we were in high school. In the 50s, 60s, in that era. Yep. Was it stinky there? Yes. It horrible yep. everywhere. <laughs> it flowed. Yeah. Terrible. And it made a mess in the river, right? Yes. yes. Highly polluting. Yeah. Yeah. The, worst, it seems. The, the town recently got a grant for half a million or something from the EPA and cleaned it up. They buried all the crap. And it's now a beautiful park, a wonderful walk. Uh, down from here, off to, it would be off to the left here. That's right along the river. Doesn't Fitzgerald own that? Charlie, yes. Right. Yeah, he wasn't too happy when they dug it all up and stuck it down and made the park and filled that up because he was afraid about it being disturbed after all those years of being, you know, being in the ground. The 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 pools, you know, that mm -hmm. they filled in. It was a mess down there. Uh, we saw the 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 uh, parsonage for the uh, the Pentecostal church. It would be to the left here. This is the Pentecostal church. It was the Free Will Baptist Church back back then. In the late 1800s, they merged with the People's Baptist Church, 
uh, down the street. And, uh, but this building is still here. We got the trees. Mm. Wouldn't you love to walk down the street? Mm -hmm. I a hot summer like this with a yep. Chase and Kimball garage. It's still there, isn't it, guys? Yeah, yeah. And uh, it is the auto body place. Which yes. side? Is, yeah. It's, it's on the north side of Summer Street, I think. Right. Is that Proudy Auto Body? I think so. Yeah. I think I'm making that up. But I think so. It looks like Proudy Auto Body. Got the cars on the inside. Oh, where is that? H.W. Blevins bungalow. Oh, a bungalow. Okay, I must be on the lake, maybe? No, maybe not. <laughs> well, there's a great big house. There's a great big house behind it. See up here on the left. So I've got to believe that that's someplace in town. But Kevin, we've lost it. You you might have a Milo picture for all we know. <laughs> Here's the. Uh, the DNA station in Foxcroft. Right. Now this is the mm -hmm. one out at the end of uh, Depot Street on off Union Street. And I think, Tom, that that building on the left is still there. The one on the right's long gone, but the one on the left is still there. Yeah, I think so. I, if, I wasn't sure that that was on Depot Street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it is. Yes, yeah. I'd never seen it like this. So that little stub that's left. Oh wow! Look at that. That's the South Street, the Lower Dam. It's not South Street. Uh, no. What is it? Essex, Essex Street. Street. Essex, Essex Street. Street. Yeah. 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 That's the Long Bridge. Long Street going out to Vaughan Street. Right the long bridge and the dam had evidently just been moved down down river a little bit it used to be above the bridge mm. and you're looking up Essex Street to uh you guys know the story that Mr. Brown the the first brown SO Brown I think yeah uh because that bridge was so long that his workers when they leave at night it was dark in there and he personally put in lamps for them I think I've heard that, yeah. So they, Lou was always yeah. proud of that. And all those buildings along River Street behind it were tenements that he built for his workers. Yes. Still all there. The the double houses there were the, mm -hmm. were the tenements, yeah. Yep. yep, yep. You can almost see the cave if you're just a little further to the Yeah, left. right, yep. Wait, Tom, there's a cave there? Tell me about there's, it. There's, there's a cave. <laughs> It was uh, the Indian cave. It was called the old Indian cave. They used to find arrowheads out in front of it. Uh, in one of the books we have at the library of photos of Dover and Foxcroft, there's a picture of the cave with a ghost in front of it, which was a trick, a trick photograph that somebody did back in those days. But all of us kids would go down there. We weren't supposed to. One child fell and got yeah. killed down there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, a yeah. Stevens, I believe. Yeah. He tried... He, he, he tried to beat the other kids down there by taking a rope that was hanging on a tree and swung out when he did the branch broke and he fell and the kids found him when they got down there in a you know, matter of minutes. We, we, weren't Very supposed, sad. we weren't supposed to be down there, so we were always down there. <laughs> I know, we were. It was a great adventure. <laughs> uh, if you went up the hill there, Kevin, uh, just up the hill a block or so, you would be a dead end that corner where the hardware store was, yep. such, the old post yeah. office, this is just down from there. Yeah. Okay. At the hospital? No, that's Cushing's house on Lincoln oh. Street. Oh. He was a judge? Was no, he, no. He no. was the dye company, Cushing's dye, was he? Yep, he was a lieutenant in the Civil War. He was wounded right. four, three or four times. There's this wonderful letter that we have 
from him written from the hospital, in, which is the old patent office in DC, that he was lying there recovering from one of his wounds and A. Lincoln came in and put his hand on him and said, my boy, thank you for what you're doing. You'll soon be home with your family. He came back and he started a dye company, which is still in existence. And uh, uh, he had this beautiful house, which is still there. It's not quite so beautiful, but it, it, it's still nice. He uh, opened the, the, he built a church, Christian Science Church, which is still there as a house. His daughter and his son, his daughter had the wedding of the century in 1908, married one of the Mayo kids. And uh, they were the creme de la creme in this, in, in both towns. Oh, big time player. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Here we are. Where's your house, Sue? I'm on the far side toward the Congo church. On the, on the top. On, on, the, on the back. We're yeah. on the top. We're about six windows down, or maybe five windows down on the top floor there. Right. Oh, on the riverside, Tom? Yes. Yeah, he's on the riverside, and I'm across the hall. Joan and I have each have apartment over there. Um, I have a picture taken from High Street, I think, when there was a big maple tree right there. Mm. Mm. It's not mm. there anymore. The stump is there. Mm-hmm. Bank building. Still there. Bank. Yeah. Yeah. Originally, this was the, uh, evidently they did these things back then. The Kineo Bank and the Trust Company built the first floor and the Odd Fellows built the top portion of it. Ah. And uh, that was, that was a men's club for a long time. The bank building is still there. It looks pretty much like it does now, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. And there's a ballroom there, right? Oh, it's On beautiful. the second or third floor. On the third floor, yeah. Yeah. Offices. Uh, the offices on the second floor, it's Dr. Hall and Dr. Uh, Evans, or Dr. Thompson, I'm sorry, had their offices on what we would think of as the right-hand side there on the second floor for many, many years. Yeah. Willis Parsons was in there. Yeah. That was a place to be in town if you had a business. Well, where that telephone pole is, is it was an entrance to the street, is an entrance to the street now, mm -hmm. the street that goes up and runs behind, well, River Street, right? Yeah. 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 Another view of, uh, of the Brown Mills when it was working. This is yeah. Vaughn, we're going out Vaughn Street here, right, guys? Right, right. right. Yeah. It's paid, but it, it looks pretty much. Postcards back then would show pictures of industry. You would never, modern postcards are always pretty pictures. But back then, they were uh, um, much more, I don't know, showing how things were in those towns. I and mean, that's where all the people were. Because the majority of people were, they would definitely have photos of it. They were proud of it. Greta, what's this building? <laughs> The library. <laughs> What's the building in the back? On the right? Mm -hmm. The, uh, I don't know. It's certainly gone now, of course. It's the parking lot. It's like a big barn. <laughs> yeah. Was that there when you guys were kids? No, I don't think so. No, because no. McDonald's Ford was right to the right. And there was just a parking lot out back. So, so it was gone by that time. Yeah. Um, and on the left, of course, the front part of that building is was the, uh, the, what we think of as the old ladies' home. Mm -hmm. It's now the police station. Oh, right, yeah. Well, the Warren yeah. home. The Warren, the Warren home. home. Right, for yeah. old ladies. And the, uh, the back part where the cupola is, that's gone now. But uh, the police department is still there. And uh, Kevin, that says 37? Yep. Is that, is that perchance a year? No. No, I think it was... Uh... It would just be part of that series, obviously, post-22. Okay. But I think um, we'll see a later view of what we showed now. Mm -hmm. um, it's always uh, great when they did this, but when they re-photographed something, 
Can you go back one slide? Yeah, no trees there. Mm -hmm. And the next one, there are trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a beautiful it's building a on the inside. Yeah. <clears throat> beautiful building on the inside. Now we'll take a look at a few of the more views of the churches. That's the Methodist, the Methodist. Church yeah. with Central Hall. To right. the, it's probably taken at the same time as the other one is Central Hall, looking at this slide on the, on the back. Baptist? No, the Universalist. No, that's the Universalist. Universalist, right, right. Going up Pleasant Street. Yeah, yep. now, the, now the music studio, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Right. Baptist. That's the Baptist. There's the Baptist. Right. Where do we see it for the trees. I know. It's amazing. It's the dirt street. Oh. What's that one? Oh, that's a Congo congregational. Mm -hmm. Yep, it sure yep. is. There you can see the end of the photographer's car. Okay. Oh, right. That's the back end, right? Yep. Yeah, okay. The town clock, Kevin, is still there. It was put there in 1875 by the Mayos. And if you're ever fortunate enough to climb up into the tower, I bet some of you guys have. The works from 1874 are still there and they still work. And, and I think, Mary, the town keeps the clock up? Yes, yes, Phyllis says yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, the high school next to the Congo Church. There's the old academy. And mm -hmm. you're right, the cannons aren't plugged. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. My dad well, went to school there. Well, probably uh, a few dads did. Yeah. About the cannons, about the cannons. Sylvia Dean once said, I bet just a little while ago, she told me, like, I've got this confession to make. It was my dad. Who did that? And we, and we said, we all know that. It's, it's been on that for about 50 years. <laughs> You've been carrying around being ashamed of it. This is Mr. Cushing's church that he built for his wife and his daughter. And Lou once told me that his wife, as a Christian scientist, died because she didn't get some medical treatment. Had you guys heard that? No. Yeah, yeah, he told me that. No, I know. A little bit to the left is was his dye factory. Mm -hmm. It was just a short walk for him to go to work. Yeah. And the building is still there, but it's run down. It's another project for the Historical Society to bring that back. Mary. Let's have your hands full. <laughs> the original food distribution place. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 Here again. What's interesting about this photo is that the brick, the, the concrete building is only half there. Right. And they built that in 1908 and they came back when the Mayo still owned it and American Willen bought it in 1914 and they put the other half on. And you could, can you guys see traces of where the buildings change? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, you yeah. can. Yeah. 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 I live under the wooden part. It's, it's all wood on that side, so that uh, you, you walk down the hall and it's concrete ceilings, and then suddenly it changes to wood. So, cool. right, yeah. Lou's apartment is half wood and half concrete. Right, right. I have a my my living room. My great room is is half and half cement <laughs> and half wood, and the and the bedroom is has the wooden ceiling. We should get some pictures. Yeah. And can you go back one? Can you go back one? The building on the right with a little nub hanging out over the river, uh, of course, was the gas station until they closed it recently. But uh, that was where the perfection cowtail holder was made by Mr. Farnham. And uh, we have a couple of those, Mary, in the Historical Society, right? <laughs> Advertised all over the country and sold all over the country that uh, the perfection cowtail holder. <laughs> When you milk the cow, you put that on his, and, and he didn't get squished by his tail. <laughs> um, Kevin, 
Yeah. Um, before we go into Milo, I don't know if anyone from Milo is here tonight, and we are getting close to 7.30, so I'm not sure if we need to do those photos. There's only five, and I'll just arrow through them so you can see okay. them. Okay, like, sure. Oh. <laughs> Main Street. Boy, that was a real town, wasn't it? The Totten Country Club. Uh -huh. Milo Junction, which- That barn's still there, isn't it? Is this Derby? What what was that? Milo yeah. Junction? It looks like Derby does have with all the, the cutter, cutter, cookie cutter houses. Are they still there? Well, yes. Yeah, I think so. Really? Huh. Wow. They're all changed now. You drive through that now and people have added and subtracted from houses. Okay. They're all different. My husband's uh, parents lived in Derby. Okay. Yeah. These are nice. Mm -hmm. Ian, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That was that collapsed. Fun. These are, this is wonderful. Thank, thank you, you Kevin. For the, uh, That's color great. It definitely makes it so much more interesting. Yes. D does anyone have a, um, questions for Kevin before we finish up? When is your, your, oh, your museum's from May to October. It is. I visited yeah, there one many years ago. I I'm found an old uh, uh, postcard family uh, album that one that somebody in my, maybe my grandmother or great grandmother had. And uh, it's pretty interesting. And I don't know where it is right now and I gotta find it because now <laughs> I'm really curious, you know, if there's, some of your postcards in here, yeah. Like I mentioned, everything that I showed you is online on our website, and uh, and I'm always available to for a phone call or an email if you have questions or want to learn more or or can tell me more. All right, uh, Kevin, we've got about fourteen hundred postcards in our collection. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you have any interest in looking at any of them to see if you got think we got things you don't. Well, I'm, I'm always interested in that because um, it tells me what I don't have and what I should be looking for. And I'm sure there are other Houston illustrating um, out there that are that are still on the land. So I would like to take you up on that sometime. Okay, it's up to you. Get in touch with Mary or Greta, and, and we'd be happy to show them to you. What I'd really like to do is come there and uh, go around with you guys and, and retake some of the photos. Because I'm, I'm personally doing some then and nows, and uh, I'm really into that. Good, good. Thank you very thank much. You much for, for chiming in. Yes, well, thank you so much, Kevin. That was really fun. And thanks to everyone who came and, and, and got to share about those photos. It's really neat to take a look back in time like that. So. See you later. All right, ha have a good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you for coming. Bye. Thank you, thank you again, Greta. Thank, thank you, Chris. You. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Mary. Bye, Mary. Bye. Good night, John boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was.